All right, how's everybody in the room? Are the levels good? Are we coming through okay on Zoom? All right, let's F and do this then, people. I had 12 cups of coffee today. Normally I have six, but I was up super late last night working on this. So welcome to WordPress, the world's most hacked, not most hacked, <laughs> I apologize, the most used content management system in the world. I, I screwed that up. I really, I'm so sorry. So um, course feedback, thank you for filling this out and being honest. Uh, I've had 15 people fill it out, close it, that's enough feedback. Um, two main takeaways from it. Uh, a couple people asked for the recordings. The recordings are available. I just don't directly post them to Canvas. Um, this is because this room we're in is my personal like recording room for, um, for my actual job. So I have to like give you this specific lecture. So if you need the recording, just ask if I forget to post it. Um, so the majority of them are on the course website. Um, so uh, another thing, some people asked about chat. So chat is disabled by default in Zoom, um, but I'm also not gonna enable it because we have a Slack channel. So if you have a question, uh, especially during class, just post it in the general channel on Slack. That also help because it'll be preserved and live beyond class in case it's a question that you know you log into Slack later in the week and go, oh, that someone already asked this. So the breakout, if you care, uh, generally people enjoyed this weird lab format of a class that I threw together. Um, slightly less on the this allows me to be more creative because um, that's a mixed bag. And then uh, you all said generally nice things about me, which is fine. I'm a little weird. Um, but this is this is the thing that I care about. And this is what administration cares about. So this I ask this every semester is do you wish there were more courses like this? So again, this is not for like me to go, oh, yay, I'm so wonderful. Thank you so much. It's this is legitimately something people in administration pay attention to. So if you want more action oriented classes, and less someone stands up here and reads you the slides and then tells you to go read chapter four in a book that costs $200, you just gotta ask for it. So, um, I'm an, I mean, honestly, this stuff doesn't affect me financially. This is, I'm an adjunct, I just enjoy doing this. Um, and as general advice when soliciting feedback or giving feedback, things like, I really like this class or aren't you wonderful? Or I just wish that I could be your child, which is a weird piece of feedback that no one left and I just made up right now. But those things are not super helpful in general um, because it's very low fidelity. It takes like two seconds to type that. Same with the don't read the comments online feedback. If someone tells you you suck, you know, just keep moving. Anyway, um, but I say this because if you give honest feedback, um, or comp, you know, longer form feedback and the SRTs later on. This is stuff that helps let administration know that there's something happening, that there are students that want the class to operate a certain way. So if you don't like the way this class works, that you're more within that right as well. People that usually reach out and engage in these feedback things, either love or hate, whatever it is. Uh, if you have a neutral opinion, you're not gonna click the button and take the 40 seconds. But anyway, let administration know, or if you run into anyone, your advisor or anything, and you actually like what's going on here. So lab six feedback, I assure you, it's not, it's not personal, it's strictly business. And it's a little hard to do business when only like 50% of you did the lab. That's what, okay, good. It was that awkward pause there, it was on purpose. So um, just so we're on the same page, the slides are on the course website. Um, I posted the, the lab and the lecture for last week. And if you need help, like I know that I've got this stupid hat on and I talk a lot of shit, but I am actually a pretty helpful person. I'm here to try and see you through to the finish line. So, um, you know, just, just get them in as soon as possible. I have a pretty lenient, lenient, can't say that word, lenient grading policy about late work as long as you actually do the requirements and turn it in. Um, and then also, if you feel like the next three weeks are a little killer because you got exams or whatever, um, week nine, we have a midterm here, which is open internet like Google and find the answers. Um, and there's nothing on that week. And there's nothing else on that week on purpose so that it gives you time to catch up with all the labs before we start into the final project. So if you find yourself falling behind or you need a little extra time, like just send me an email or drop me a DM on Slack or whatever. It's not a big deal. 
you know, even make up an excuse. That's, that's better than saying nothing, to be perfectly honest, as life advice from me, senior year. So um, also, I realize stuff happens. So I have, you know, I mentioned a pretty lenient grading policy. And so even in my own world, uh, shit happens sometimes. And you have to say, hey, I didn't get any of you graded this week yet. And the reason is because my children named this, this stray kitten underneath our, um, my parents' porch. And I believe the name went something like, but if we don't save her, she'll die this winter, daddy. Please, can we save her, papa? Look, she'll freeze to death. But instead of that long name, we're actually just calling her Momo for short. So um, I've been a little busy fixing up this kitten. So I, I'm just saying, I understand if you fall behind, it's not the end of the world. Just let me know if you need help. That's what we're here for. So for the other like 60% or so of people that turned it in, um, there was a good mix of 11D, Hack CMS, Grav, uh, even a Doxify in there. Um, so good explanations of how these interface with a file system. Um, that's what we're mainly going for is how do we make changes in this website? How does it relate to the file system to try and unpack how the file system can actually be a data model or like a database? So good lists of pros and cons, getting things set up. A um, few of you even tried your hand at the bonus. Um, again, I like power skimmed through everything <laughs> because, of, because of the cat. But um, I'll, I'm also not gonna post the feedback for this publicly until we give some people some more time to actually catch up and do this lab. Um, so I'll probably have that back to you at the end of the week. So at, the, at minimum, there was at least partial credit worthiness of the bonus stuff that I did see. So with that, we're on to Super CMS Land 2. And as everyone knows, for whatever reason, Super CMS Land 2 takes place in a totally different world, different character set. Uh, Super CMS 1 looked like garbage, but Super CMS 2 looks really pretty. It actually has six golden coins you need to achieve. And for the first time ever, Wario comes into existence. And as is, I keep making a point of doing, it's really important to connect with your audience with a game that was produced at least a decade before they existed on Earth. So if you don't know who Wario is, Wario is our troll in chief. Uh, back in the day before we had a real one. So this is gaming's first troll by my definition. So um, I have some pretty significant bias in this area and that's why Trolley McBoatface is gonna be making a lot of appearances through these slides. So if you're not aware of Trolley McBoatface, this is Trolley McBoatface uh, version of EdTech Joker. So um, I've written a hacks plugin for WordPress. I wrote the same plugin and ported it to six other platforms and WordPress took me the longest because it's a flaming dumpster fire of developer conventions. It's an absolute piece of garbage. And yet it's a testament to the fact that the best solution doesn't always win. It's the one that people gravitate to because of marketing or because it just got lucky at the right moment, right? Maybe you too can create your own Weebly or whatever product you name you want to insert there. Wix, fill in the blank doesn't have to be the best experience. It just has to actually get to market at the right time and land with the right people and get the right funding. So um, WordPress has recently adopted uh, a plugin that was supposed to be community driven, but it wasn't uh, called Gutenberg. And Gutenberg, if you play with it or know what it is, it's damn near a hacks competitor. They started, I started working on hacks. They started working on this thing around the same time, completely not knowing each other existed. Um, uh, in Gutenberg and WordPress land, there's also something called Elementor, um, but basically they toss the community to the side on that one. So, and all of these have a good mix of, of good and bad. There's not like a perfect solution in this space. Um, but I will say that Hacks is a direct threat to the platform lock-in that these require. So Elementor and Gutenberg's power is found completely in the communities that they're attached to versus Hacks can work in anything. So again, I have a hell of a lot of bias in this space. So like normally, if you see me say anything about Gutenberg, I spell it Gutenberg, um, which people seem to enjoy. I've given conference talks about how much Gutenberg is a piece of flaming garbage, uh, both from an accessibility perspective, a user experience perspective, but um, my real concern being a long-term sustainability perspective. And unfortunately for public community run sites, I'm not the only one. So. This is a required plugin of WordPress, which now has a community going for about 13 years, I think, or sorry, no, 17 years. Um, and these are public reviews of people that have it installed. 
right? So there's an overwhelming number of one-star reviews, and yet this was crammed into this platform. So uh, to quote my best friend, I have thoughts about that, or I have thoughts and opinions. Um, and so I have many thoughts and opinions on WordPress, and they aren't always objective. And I'll just tell you that in advance. In fact, I'll put Trolley McBoatface on a lot of slides, and you can glean from it that I'm probably offering up my opinion, but there is always going to be some truth there. So um, topics for today, what is WordPress? You're going to get into the database aspects of this. So this is going to bring us back to a MySQL backed uh, web system as opposed to our static site detour. So we're going to talk about table prefixing uh, and multi-sites, which is a unique capability of WordPress, something they really pushed forward into the web, something you've actually probably used or used a site of and not realized it. Uh, we're going to talk, look at the relationship between content and the way it's stored in the database in WordPress and then tee things up for today's lab. So uh, some potential resume bullet points here because I like trying to add that. Uh, WordPress site building is a thing. It's a Googleable industry term. Play around with WordPress and actually build out like a small shopping cart. You can do it by just clicking buttons. Learning the WordPress user interface is actually something you can do as a, a real job. Um, either as site contracting for individuals or like there's whole companies that all they do is manage WordPress sites like for thousands of clients. So it's a real skill. Um, Multi-site management as well, even though it's not the most popular thing in high scale industry, it's, it's still definitely a thing. Um, Gutenberg as an editor, classic press, uh, classic editor and Elementor, just as far as knowing what plugins are in this ecosystem and being able to understand the lingo. So uh, WordPress.org is uh, for all things WordPress. Has anyone been to WordPress.org? Mm, room, all right, okay. There's at least one head nod. So has anyone blogged on WordPress.org before? Wrong! It's not possible! You're thinking of WordPress.com. Sorry, I just really wanted to yell at someone right there. That's the caffeine kicking and I apologize. So there is a huge disconnect and complete difference between WordPress.org and .com that they leverage to their benefit heavily. Um, and everyone does this. Everyone says, oh, I have a WordPress.org site. No, it's not possible. So this is the community site. This is where thousands of developers download millions of lines of code every day and deploy it out to people. So this is where you learn about the project, get involved, see who does hostings, check out showcase themes and, and websites. So this is the community side of WordPress. And I use air quotes and Trolley shows up because they've kind of hijacked the notion of community because of what just happened there, where two people out of five here said, yeah, I have a WordPress.org site. They did this on purpose. So there is a company called <laughs> Advomatic that runs WordPress.com. And so this is an extremely useful and clever bit of marketing when the owner of a company owns the trademark for the name WordPress, releases WordPress and builds up a community around it. So even if something says it's open source, there's a ton of of power and money to be gleamed around putting things out as open source. It's, it's not all, all sunshines and rainbows like I make it out to be sometimes. So uh, for example, there was this, and this is about a year and a half, uh, yeah, August, 2019. Okay, so about a year ago, really. Um, Verizon bought Tumblr, who the hell knows why, but Verizon bought Tumblr, which is just this little micro blogging platform and they sold it to, as the articles all said, WordPress's owners. Does anyone see a problem with saying WordPress's owners potentially? So if you're, if you're part of a community of tens of thousands of people contributing to something, you go, who the F's the owner? All of us are working on this together. We're all rowing in a common direction, except that's just kind of the way that people talk about it because the the guy that owns WordPress, Matt Mullingworth, I believe is how you pronounce his name, um, he owns a trademark on WordPress. And so then people just use this community and this like publicly traded, not publicly traded, but just public company, as far as the sites that you have access to and can pay for hosting, they kind of use these words interchangeably. So it does get confusing. And this phrase actually pisses a lot of people off that I know. <laughs> um, this notion of WordPress's owners and saying, well, wait, it's, it's a, 
You mean my blogging platform? Why did they buy a company Verizon hat? So they did it for user base, uh, just to get more blogs on WordPress.com. But um, anyway, out in, out in the real working world, and if you search Glassdoor, this is kind of old, but I'm sure you could come up with a similar thing. You can actually Google or set up a thing on Glassdoor and say, hey, show me jobs about WordPress. And note this wide range. This will come into play, um, particularly next week. We're going to look at Drupal. I'll have the same slide, so we'll keep this in mind. Um, you can have jobs that are anywhere from $13,000 to $165,000 a year in this space. And that is a massive range, right? The reason is that site builders, people that click the buttons in the UI, things we'll do um, this week, uh, that would be on the low end of the spectrum. And full-time developers working for companies like Advomatic or, or others, they're gonna be on that high end of the spectrum. So there's a really big chasm there between the people building plugins and extending a system versus those clicking through the UI and just building on the site. So I, I'm not gonna showcase a lot of sites. There's a ton of sites that are part of the WordPress.org showcase. Uh, lots of media companies. The White House, I believe, is currently on WordPress. Um, so you can go check out if you want. If you've used sites.psu.edu or you've gone to a site there, that is a, is a WordPress system. Uh, so you have used WordPress. In fact, it hits you right in the face and says, create websites easily with WordPress. So what is WordPress? Um, this is the most used open source content management system out there. Um, again, these are estimated, but it's estimated to power 35% of all websites on the internet based on traffic data and just domain registrations. Um, that's a little crazy, really, if you think about it, that there's one platform and code base that's able to meet that many use cases for people. Um, it is also a little misleading because let's say you have sites.psu.edu. There's, you know, roughly 100,000 students. If each of you have to log in for some English 15 class and make your own little blog, you've made a website. Should that really count in the totality of sites on the internet? If you each make a site, should that really count as two separate registries? So it is somewat estimate based, but for comparison, Drupal, which we'll cover next week, powers approximately 1% of the internet. So way down there by comparison and grab and Hack CMS and those things, it's not even measurable. I mean, you're talking like tens of thousands of sites out of billions. So um, it is a MySQL database uh, with a powerful front end editor, you just kind of click and build stuff. It's PHP on the back end, just like uh, Grab was. Uh, and it's got a plugin architecture and with a really friendly UI. It also has the ability to like click a button and say like update the code and it just self updates. Um, Stupidness. Uh, so part of how it's doing this is it has an abstraction layer. Now it's not the greatest abstraction layer in the world. Um, and in part, you know, I'll knock this, but I can, you know, probably 13 years from now, if I'm running any of my own code base, I'll be able to knock that too. That's, that's technical debt and that's legacy, right? So the WordPress code base has a unique ability in that they claim backwards compatibility from days, day one. Day one was in 2003. So they claim that if you started a site in 2003, you could kind of just keep hitting update in the interface and get all the way to today and not break your site. That is unheard of. <laughs> it's part of why a lot of, of uh, people use it, but it's also a huge negative when you get to high scale types of systems like Penn State would require for a top level domain or, or complex workflows um, because of that technical debt. It's also, a, if, if you care about the code base, it's a high mix of like, object-oriented programming, but also functional programming, just writing functions directly and calling them. So uh, in writing a plugin for this, I had to learn, I had to basically Google like, how do you do whatever in WordPress? What's the name of this function in WordPress um, to figure out what they were. So on install, um, it, it automatically sets up its own database schema. So because it has this abstraction where it can connect to a database and do these issue these calls against it, kind of like our super hackable script, I'll say hackable for a reason, uh, from week five. Um, it, every WordPress site sets up this very basic 12 table ER diagram. So this is actually from their docs. Um, and it, it shows you exactly what it sets up every time you make a WordPress site. So it's gonna have some things for metadata, for vocabulary and taxonomy. It's gonna have, in this case, says relationship, right? So you can see the many to many 
types of relationships between uh, taxonomy and your post. So whenever you make a post in WordPress, it's writing to this table. Uh, whenever someone leaves a comment, that comment's connected to a user, even if that user's anonymous. And then that is connected to the post because you need to know what user wrote a post. You could also look up what post is this comment for. So it's a pretty readable uh, data structure. When you install it and reclaim hosting, you end up getting uh, lots of WP underscore whatever. So that's the name of all the tables that I mentioned. It doesn't matter what your convention is as long as you go with it. Can anyone think of potentially why a code base from 2003 would have WP underscore in front of all of its tables? Nothing. It's older than several of you potentially. So um, shared hosting was the only way that people ran anything. There was no virtualization or cloud-based platforms. So a lot of groups were running, you know, if you had a hundred websites, you were lucky. If you had five websites running on the same web server and it didn't crash, that was pretty good. So you would probably be running one database server with this happened to be installed next to everything else. So this is called table prefixing is this notion of WP underscore tries to like namespace or prefix what the tables are so that they would install nicely alongside any other garbage your, your uh, organization has made. Again, that's a window into how old this is. Now, it's a, it's a decent size code base on install. You see it's 50 megs, um, but then the database itself is very small. So the database it sets up with is only 200K to start. So who's the audience for this? It's a lot of like website tonight, click to deploy, Maybe you sort of know what code is. Maybe you know what CSS is. Um, it's much more like, I just want to put myself on the internet and it's for writing uh, primarily. So um, there's, this community has a lot of interest in paying to get the job done. <laughs> like there's lots of plugins like shopping carts and things that you can search shopping cart and you can search theme and search for nice themes and slap together a nice design with a shopping cart. And then maybe the plugin you got is like, hey, pay us 10 bucks a month and we'll wire this up so you can collect payments. It's a very, they're, not that you have to do this in your reclaim hosting thing, but it's a very common convention in WordPress to get a useful plugin that's free, but then have to pay money for extra stuff for it. Um, so it's a lot of people that are uh, SEO hungry or search engine optimization. I know a lot of people in that space that know how to write search terms. They know what the logistics are, but they don't write code necessarily. So um, uh, some key concepts in WordPress, there's plugins, which extend functionality, themes, which make it look nice. And then this is the biggie as we get to Drupal next week, there's pages and posts. So everything you go to in a WordPress site is either a page, like this is a static page, like about us, or a post, like a blog post. This is an extremely limiting, uh, type of inflection point, but it's in the core of the whole platform, which tells you that it really is a blogging platform at its core. Everything is attached to a post or a page. There's nothing else. You can get plugins that extend it to do other things, but those are the main two. So uh, some of its strengths, small single team publishing, uh, small team or single publishing flows, it's really good in marketing, really good for SEO. Um, throw together a shopping cart and just click a few buttons. My 402 class, they actually, for, for this, this topic, they have to make a soap selling website that looks like a real soap selling website and add media and pick a theme that looks like it's a shopping cart and improve SEO. All stuff that you can fake in a few hours, really. <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive. So where it's weak, and again, trolley comes back, is definitely security. Um, complex publishing workflows, so if you had like, 10 people that have to approve uh, a news release for the university, it's probably not gonna be in WordPress. That's just not what their strength is. Uh, complex content types. So um, Drupal is where we'll definitely look at that. We'll be able to model our whole database from the first five weeks in Drupal's user interface. Um, WordPress, everything's a post or a page. And all the UI is, hey, is this a static page or is it a blog post? Um, accessibility, uh, it doesn't have the ability to make forms natively, which is ridiculous, but um, encoding standards, and I have a lot of vomit emojis, obviously. So um, sites at PSU is, is what's known as a big multi-site. You shift into the way this data is, is stored and structured. So 
Does anyone know what the phrase pass or sass means? Or have you seen this anywhere? Could anyone define what a pass or a sass is? What's up, Joe? So SaaS is, yes, SaaS is software as a service. What do you think PaaS is? Obviously there's the as a service. <laughs> so PaaS is platform as a service. So think of it as the abstraction of, so if software as a service is, I click, I go somewhere and hey, it, it served my needs, I set up my own website. Think of PaaS as a vendor selling to someone who wants to sell the thing to let people click the button and set up a website. So this would be, uh, um, Sites at Penn State is a SaaS offering to all of you as the end user, but to the university, there's a vendor called Campus Press that sells the platform to them to use as their own service. So um, this, is, this is a multi-site, uh, the SaaS offering piece is a multi-site in WordPress land. So WordPress can be configured in what's known as a multi-site mode. You can actually do this in Reclaim Hosting to see, how, um, see what it does. It's one of the options this week for lab. So it means there's one database, sounds good already, and using table prefixing, you can have multiple websites stored in that one database. So Reclaim doesn't recommend this for reasons that I hope are obvious to some people based on the inflection I used, even though I don't have Trolley on here. Um, but you can click a button and you can make a multi-site. You can basically make your own copy of sites at PSU um, through one click in Reclaim hosting. It's kind of neat. So um, what is table prefixing? I mentioned it before. This is a decent answer from Stack Overflow. It's basically just putting a little bit of um, an acronym and then an underscore before a table. This isn't a real thing. It's not like a, a can, it's, it's more the way people have used SQL and table design. It's not like you run like the way that you do a select. It's not a syntax type of a thing. So um, you can actually make a site in WordPress that can make more WordPress sites, which is a little weird for sure. Um, that's actually, if you think of, if you set up Hack CMS um, for lab last week, Think of it like, hey, you installed it and it does nothing. And it, uh, the first thing it says is, hey, make a site. Very similar connotation. So it's a way of managing multiple sites. So can anyone see a potential issue here as this is a screenshot of my WP underscore here. This comes from the same database. Just shout it out at that point, Joe. You keep us moving on here. Yeah, so he, he said, uh, can't you just make your own database that mimics this, or the, your table that mimics this pattern and you have a site? Well, WordPress doesn't store it that way, but it's a similar issue is if you can log into the database and see these tables, it means you can drop these tables. It means you can do anything to them. So you have one user that effectively has control over all of these tables, right? These are not sites that we have segregated. Um, much like in the Simpsons example, I had to, we talked about making a specific user that maybe can only do select statements, or maybe only insert data. Imagine every website you do is in one database. So uh, Penn State actually ran into this trap several years ago. Uh, there was a group here, we were running our own uh, like non-vendor supported version of sites at PSU and the database got to be several gigs. And you start running into, um, there we go, certain issues with that. So uh, security, you have one user, right? So imagine uh, some people figured out that whole hyphen hyphen hack. If you can exploit one plugin in one site, you can exploit the entire multi-site. You can kill every site and screw with every site that's on there. Uh, you also run into what's called noisy neighbor. So that would be one site's getting a lot of traffic. That's negatively impacting all the other sites because they connect to the exact same database. Uh, migration becomes uh, damn near impossible. So Penn State at one point had over 30,000 sites and had to um, migrate them, migrate a multi-gig database. You basically have to take the entire system offline for a while and do the work to move it somewhere. It's not possible to move it in chunks. 
So it's very difficult to replicate, difficult to move, um, but it has the added pros of simplicity. Like you click a few buttons and you get new websites. It's pretty amazing, very empowering uh, for individual uh, shops or users. Someone that might design a bunch of sites for like local businesses, doesn't understand a lot about the web, but can do marketing. So um, this actually gets into something that's called uh, replication in database land. So in a, and this is, I say, I kind of have to tell you this because it's one of the objectives of the course. I don't believe in this. No one does this that I know. This is the way you used to do things. So I will tell you the way you used to do things, which is that you would have a read write database. So you have one database, if you're thinking of this a little ER diagram, and our web users interfacing with it. They're adding content, they're querying and viewing page content. Well, whenever someone adds a new post for safety and security reasons, we would actually take that and replicate it to another database somewhere else, sometimes called cold storage. Um, so this would be a backup. Maybe our server gets corrupted or the database gets corrupted. We always have a copy over here that we can access at a later point in time. So this course doesn't cover blue green deployments, but that's kind of what's replaced this methodology. Instead of having a singular server with a singular database that then gets replicated on its own routine, people are just replicating the whole damn infrastructure. So people aren't really doing this prime, at least from what I've seen, there are still places where you do this. I don't want to knock it entirely, but it's less common than it once was. Uh, you basically are just cloning the entire infrastructure somewhere else. Uh, even internally for my own testing, we have a clone of our infrastructure. We don't clone the database, we clone the whole setup because we don't just care about the data, we care about the whole application and being able to access it. So um, here's a, an interesting life lesson, you know, I like my detours. So this is a way, this is a, a, a life tip on how to never get a promotion at a major land grant institution. I don't know which one this would be about, but just hypothetically in academia. So say these things out loud at a meeting and see how many friends you have internal to a large organization. Again, hypothetically. So what you do is you would make the following slides and then you would read them out loud and record them onto the internet. So this is the way that we like to spend money on certain products. So if you have a product and you put it on a website and you say for education, that is an instant way to make money on the internet here. Additionally, if you have the word courseware, that would be another really great way to make money with a brand new product because it's courseware, it's no longer for education, it's specific. Also, if you could find champions within an organization that know what the word WordPress is and can combine that with the word courseware or the word for education, holy shit, you could just be printing money, printing money all over the place. It's a totally different thing. It's no longer WordPress. It's WordPress for this specific thing, right? So then what you can do is you can meet up at a conference. You can claim your product is different when it really isn't. It's just WordPress with the word for education. And then you can just keep printing money. And I'm, I'm sure this doesn't exist in the real world, but we certainly have not paid for this product on the screen, which is literally just a WordPress multi-site. It's, it's WordPress. They're very nice people. They have it configured a certain way, but it's literally WordPress with free plugins and a half decent theme. You can set the whole damn thing up yourself on Reclaim Hosting by clicking a button. And we pay for it as if it's a unique being because it's WordPress or sites at PSU, which is just Campus Press. It's a company, um, and it just is not knocking those people. It's not knocking the people that make these purchasing decisions. This is just what happens at scale at large organizations, is someone goes, oh, I built a WordPress site that worked great. Oh, this, these people host WordPress sites. Bingo, print money. So uh, this is WordPress for education. Again, if you've gone to sites at PSU, you can do almost everything you can at wordpress.com except some things you can't. So then people just go to wordpress.com anyway, which makes me not understand what this product is for. But so uh, Sites at PSU is a deployment of uh, this SaaS offering, right? So you can actually just go buy your own whitelisted version of a multi-site and sell it to universities. It's pretty cool. And it's called Canvas Press. Um, and again, it's not knocking them. There's some people that don't have their own infrastructure. Hosting is a real thing that costs money and has you know, serious scale considerations. But all of the technology in this setup is completely free. It's just the knowledge that has formed the gap that you're paying for. 
So, um, and another trolley aside, WordPress.com is not a multi-site. So it does not suffer the same issues that WordPress.org's free architecture does. Because when we're the owner of an open source project, it's really important that you are really into giving away everything open, except for the thing that makes you a shitload of money. So just make sure you keep that in mind. When you start a huge open source project and you have a foundation and you push the ideals of open source, remember the stop gap is, yeah, but if we open sourced our infrastructure, that would actually liberate too many people and they wouldn't need us anymore. And we all gotta get paid, right? So, and this is not a segue at all. It's just um, looking at some of the other systems we set up where you had the option of setting up and reclaim. Right, so Hack CMS is a multi-site by default. It's very small file size, it has no database, um, but it's not multi-user. So this is an, a huge win for WordPress with the things I was just trolling actually. Right, when you log in to sites at PSU, you don't have to make a new account, it's just integrated with the institution. Um, if, if I make a site that gets a lot of traffic, which is not gonna happen there, but let's say I did, it would slow down all of your sites However, you're not gonna be able to edit my site and I can't edit yours. In Hack CMS, I don't even have that concept. It's just, you own all the sites, right? So there is that multi-user capability with WordPress. It's a big deal. Um, Grav is also a single site, has no database, right? So it has almost the same amount of files deployed on the file system as WordPress. It's a pretty complex project. Um, it can do multi-sites. I've never set one up but those would be multi-user is my understanding. So it can do some of the capabilities of WordPress. Grav drew a ton of inspiration from WordPress. So if you played with Grav last week and then you start playing with WordPress and something feels familiar, it's probably because Grav came out later and looked at what worked with WordPress and just kind of blatantly copied ideas. So uh, WordPress's Hello World footprint mentioned previously, it's about 50 megs, very small database. Uh, and a very friendly admin UI, right? So you get this path you can just click to, and then you can go to town and work on your site. And as everyone knows, with a friendly UI on, on the internet that auto updates and installs plugins, and a plugin is made up of database calls and, and PHP code executing, nothing could ever go wrong, like literally ever. Nothing could ever go wrong with a button that a user clicks to auto update their website, or hell, remote executed code that updates itself. Again, nothing could ever go wrong there. But I mean, if it could, uh, it would happen all the time. And so if you search for the phrase WordPress, one of the most highest autocompletes is hacked. Um, this is an extremely susceptible target to hacking. Uh, there's tons of things out there in the blogosphere, usually written using WordPress, which I find hilarious, but writing on WordPress, talking about the ills of WordPress and its security. Um, and these are fairly recent. I mean, this one, WordPress hacked, what to do when your site is in trouble. This is from last month. <laughs> so like these are not outdated things. You can always refresh a good WordPress hack every month or so when it gets hacked. So a lot does go wrong in this sphere, but that's because it's a big target. Now, uh, if you had 35% of the web as a potential target, wouldn't you try and constantly target it if your goal is to steal private IP from people or resources or do Bitcoin mining? So like, I'm not totally knocking WordPress. It's one of those, um, the issue Windows used to always have is yes, it was susceptible, Microsoft Windows that is, but it also powered everything. So when you power like 90% of systems, of course people are gonna go after you. If you have 10% of systems or in Drupal's case, 1%, you're not gonna care nearly as much. Although there's a real fun hack associated with Drupal's 1%. Um, so, this is, and again, this is where those things like poor coding standards that a person that just clicks and gets the site they wanted, they don't think about that, but it starts to manifest itself in real ways. So all the areas where WordPress gets hacked on a regular basis come from the plugin architecture. They come from the way other developers implement their plugins and tie into it. Yes, there are core issues with WordPress that they can get hacked, but as we saw from the initial database design, it's pretty simplistic. It's got 12 tables and the, ta the database structure is gonna directly relate to how much code runs to actually give you a website. So 
Uh, and this is, I thought this was funny. There was actually, while I was reading an article to formulate these slides, a pop-up ad came up and said like, hey, do you need to save your website? I can totally do it. Just click here, which felt like a way of hacking my website. I'm not going to lie. Um, so, all right, back to, back to WordPress database land. Enough trolling and making fun of the fact that it's highly hackable. Anything can be highly hackable. Hell, my projects are probably highly hackable, but, it, you know, people would have to actually use them for me to know. So um, going to another topic that's in WordPress land and interface of the database um, is the battle for the body field. Now, this is a phrase my um, colleague Michael Potter uses all the time is the battle for the body field. And it comes from this List Apart article. List Apart is a really popular like web development blog. Um, and Jeff Eaton's really big in the Drupal community, but he's getting, he's making a name for just self in the web in general. And it's in part because of this article. So I highly encourage you to go check it out if you're interested in CMSs at all. Um, but he's basically talking about that the way that we make up a page and we empower someone to uh, generate that page, there's kind of this battle going on amongst teams of people as to how to construct that page. Um, so everybody has a different mental model for how to do that. And to this week, we're going to look at four of these. So a tiny MCE is used on a ton of platforms, millions, uh, WordPress and beyond. Um, but it was the default way of editing a WordPress site. It's what people uh, knew how to do back in the day. Uh, Elementor is a newer uh, way of doing it. It's a pretty slick UI, I'm not going to lie. Um, I'll show it next uh, on class Thursday. Um, and then Gutenberg is the new default. It's default as of, I believe, the end of 2019. Um, and then there was the Hacks plugin that I mentioned. It came out right around then, too. So there's like these four unique ways of managing the page area of content for you to present yourself in a WordPress site. So ultimately what's happening where we get this body uh, battle for the body field, and this is a unique thing to WordPress versus like grav when you would save, it would write to that, that singular file, right? So imagine in WordPress with a database driven page, it's going to take that content and actually save it into a field in the database. And so this is an area where WordPress certainly has a really good uh, cornerstone on simplicity. Like, well, I'll, we'll do the same thing with a Drupal site and you won't even be able to understand where anything is. It's so complicated in the way it disaggregates and stores it. But so everything is effectively fighting for going into this post underscore content field. So it's very easy to find all the, all the, the posts for a WordPress site. You can even make your own new post on the website just by adding a row to this table. So, it's in uh, WP underscore posts dot post underscore content. So you can see there's something that looks sort of like HTML in there. So in tiny MCE's world, and this is the way WordPress worked for uh, 16 years. Um, so again, that legacy, you start to understand why people would be a little PO'd about having a brand new way to edit literally everything. But so you would have an editor that looks like this. Um, if this looks familiar, this whoops, this bar across the top, um, I believe this is what Campus uses as well. A lot of systems use this. So you could click it on an image and like do some minor repositioning. You could type. It's mostly a typing first type of a way of interfacing the web. So what it does is you're actually writing HTML. So when you hit save, it, this is what's in that field. All right, so we have H3s, we've got paragraphs. It's all just stored in a big blob of data. So then if we look at the way that Hacks would handle this, Hacks is going and it's having um, some of the text writing capabilities, but also some of the block editing capabilities of advanced editors, where it's letting you select and create advanced types like memes uh, and uh, columns, um, being able to pull in media from other sources, YouTube videos, things like that, and doing them in this nice high fidelity manner. Well, what Hacks is doing is it's, it's still just writing HTML. So you're still just editing HTML, using web components in this case, and storing that still as just a big blob in the database. So let's look at, then, at Elementor then. Elementor gives, and it's a plugin you can get download and install for it. So it has the ability to do columns. You can just click and start building columns. It has paragraphs of text and headings. It has some advanced widgets, like there's Google Maps right there. And then what gets stored is this. Now, on the one hand, that's kind of nice. And this is literally the output of this. So even though I have columns here, I didn't store them. 
So on the one hand, this is kind of nice. It has just my text. This is highly portable. I can take this somewhere else. On the other hand, it's vomit inducing because what it's done is it's taken the other aspects of the page written to a totally different table and then uh, serialized it, which is to take a data serialization is you take a data object in programming, you smash it into a big string, like a big long list of items. So all of the data associated with like where that header shows up, the color of it, the fact that it's positioned next to a paragraph, that doesn't actually live in the page data. That lives in this magic other Elementor code, which means every time you would load that page, it has to load that magic other code to interpret, to do something simple like a column spread. I also have this highlighted just for funsies. So this I also thought was not a good sign. Uh, this first data blob is, um, is JSON. So that's what we looked at uh, earlier. And so this is, something that would come across on the front end loaded in the website. This is not JSON, this is PHP serialization, which is not a normal way of, I mean, it's a normal way of storing PHP variables, but it's a little weird that they would use both when they have total control of the platform. Um, and then we get to Gutenberg, which is now the default, right? So you have to actually actively disable this, which if you're not a technical user, which is part of their audience, this, that's kind of hard, even though it's like two clicks. So Gutenberg is very pretty. Um, I must say, it makes a lot of sense, especially if anyone's written posts on like Medium, it'll definitely give you that Medium plus one type of a vibe. Um, that you can move things around easily. It's very pretty to engage with and make content. But it does this when it saves, which I think is the worst of all of them. So you make a paragraph, it does store a paragraph, and then it, it Gutenberg doesn't know how to edit it as a paragraph unless it's wrapped in this bizarre, um, this syntax, and this syntax is called HTML comments. So this is basically creating a fake area that only Gutenberg will see. So if you were to render this page, you, the page wouldn't have all this crap in it. Um, however, it's using this to store meaning, right? So there's stylistic um, connotations of quote, of paragraph, and it does this with everything. If you install, if you put a uh, YouTube video in the page, it's an iframe, it won't know it's there unless it is wrapped internally with this, this material. That means that things that were written in hacks or in um, Elementor or in TinyMCE don't render in Gutenberg, <laughs> um, which pisses a lot of people off. Um, and conversely, if you write something in Gutenberg and then switch to TinyMCE, it won't look the right way because all the style convention is stored in these little comment blocks. So uh, Gutenberg made a lot of people vomit emoji. So many, in fact, that they did something that is uh, a normal con everyday convention in open source projects in which a ton of people started forking the project. Now, forking is totally natural. Um, you can see this on uh, any GitHub repo. If you click insights and hit the forks button, um, there's also like network is pretty interesting. You can see the ways at which developers fork each other's work and how those can resolve back to a singular source. So it's not a bad thing necessarily, um, but sometimes you go, I just, we, we can't be friends anymore. Like this is a deal breaker for me, all right? This relationship's over. And so instead of adding new functionality, you actually just go back to WordPress before Gutenberg was put in, you delete Word Gutenberg, and then you call it something brand new. <laughs> and then you don't contribute to WordPress actively anymore. You just contribute to Classic Press in this case, and other projects have done this. It's not like to totally troll um, the WordPress community or anything. Um, we'll look at a fork of Drupal as well next week. But so Classic Press is business focused, as it says, which means it's, it's the same as WordPress, it just doesn't have Gutenberg. <laughs> um, you can use all of WordPress's plugins. Um, they're starting to have their own like community set up and infrastructure and agree upon the way people will add new functionality or the direction of the project. And they have a community first approach as it says there. So they are in part saying, hey, we're community first because they believe that the WordPress community is no longer community first. Um, no one wanted the Gutenberg editor to be in the core product, except the team at Advomatic that has most of the development talent 
to make it happen. <laughs> so they want to compete with Wix and Squarespace and these big cats in that industry. And they put it in their open source project, which is fine. They can do that. But when tens of thousands of people's livelihood depend on this product, you have to make sure that you have an alignment of vision as to where you think this community is going. So they literally went in, rewrote the names of things so that when you install its database, it does CP underscore instead of WP underscore. Um, functions are named classic press underscore instead of WordPress underscore. Um, and it's not without reason and it's not without community growing in strength because in your WordPress site, when you click plugins and you do add new, you can search for a plugin, but it suggests like, hey, here's some featured ones. And the very first one, which bubbles here because of popularity, is the original text editor. So everyone loves the platform so much that the most installed plugin is the old plat is the platform's old editor. Um, now you might just say, okay, well, Classic Press exists, but why? Because you could just install this editor. Well, the core team of WordPress.org has said, we're only maintaining the classic editor until um, I think it was January, 2021, or maybe it's the end of 2021. So they've said, we're not gonna support this anymore. And if it gets deprecated, then a lot of security uh, policies at places will no longer allow that to be installed. So a lot of people are, this is a serious thing in this community. This powers 35% of the internet's websites this has a lot of potential to shift people over to other code bases. So it's one of the most popular plugins. I think it's amazing. Um, so for the lab this week, we're gonna wanna find this plugin. Um, this is the, one of the only required plugins to install. Um, there are other plugins. You, get, you can get all the other plugins for the other editors directly through here, but Query Monitor is really what I'll go through uh, on Thursday. It's a really cool plugin that just shows a bar at the bottom of the page and it lets you unpack how the page you're viewing was just made. And it has all the SQL calls involved. So it's a really good way to kind of reverse engineer what's happening with a WordPress site, which WordPress, any given page will have like 20 to 40 SQL calls to render, we'll say. Um, but it's a cool way to, to take what we've been going through in SQL land and relate that to a fully finished content management system and see the way that this product is, is, wor is working. So that's a query monitor plugin will show up in our lab today. So uh, it's, it, oh shit, I screwed up. So it's, it's, wa it's uh, web lab seven time, make the announcement of it. Um, so we've got our overview as to what's gonna be delivered this week. So. Similar to last week, build a five page site. Part of this, and part of the CMS's um, swing of this is um, get experience with these things and play around with them, right? Be able to build a hello world site. It's literally a resume bullet point. Like you might not think it is right now, but a lot of your peers are not gonna know what the internals of a WordPress site are or even what graph CMS is. And that might be that one conversation <laughs> on an interview about like, oh, what have you been doing in your free time? Oh, I set up a graph site. Oh, what's graph? Like, you don't know where that conversation is going to go with a potential interviewer. So um, I want you to build a five page site again. Uh, but this time we're gonna do it in WordPress or Classic Press. They both basically the same thing. Um, we're going to use PHP my admin to demonstrate comprehending this relationship again, being able to understand that when the content is modified, how that traverses to the database system, using query monitor can certainly help find that, uh, what that pathway is. So your website scenario is that pesky manager, Chris is back. And this time he won't even certify your paycheck. Oh shit, I wasn't supposed to put that in here, sorry. So he's oddly stopped caring about databases or security for that matter, and trusts the herd of open source developers to save him from the botnets. Um, and that's only sort of a joke. The 35% um, of the internet, that makes a huge target for troll campaigns. But that also means 35% of the internet's, you know, the developers attached to those products have a direct interest in making sure everybody's sites are immune, right? So the, yes, it'll, something will get hacked. And one of those plugins I showed uh, said it had 700,000 sites affected. But then people fix that, roll it out to the 700,000 sites, and you've improved the security of 700,000 sites. So it's a double-edged sword. It's not all bad. Um, so he's making you use WordPress. Oh, God. 
So he has uh, a more pressing concern though. How are we gonna set up our authoring experience for content contributors? So he knows there's four ways you could do it. And Chris wants you to play around with these different ways of creating content to make a, a selection as to which one you think is the easiest to teach someone else. So that could be in part, you know, which one did you think was the easiest to do? This stupid mask today, man, it keeps falling off. Um, he wants you to keep in mind though, that the team works on other content management systems. And so that content portability, while not paramount, is something we should be considering, right? So of those four, some of them can move their content better than others. It's not to say that that's the ultimate thing, but it's something that is a cert, uh, definitely a pro in certain situations. So uh, he knows their advantages and trade-offs for everything. He trusts you to make the call either way, as long as you provide evidence of how you're doing it. So pick any of the editors mentioned this week and create a five page site, making the case for that editor. So you'll have to enable the plugin, configure WordPress a bit, add some content. Um, those things by themselves are not terribly difficult. Like you should be able to play with at least three of the editors rather rapidly through like three clicks. Um, and there's a ton of nice themes too. I'm not gonna go over themes in any way, but like it's, this is one of the reasons people really gravitate to WordPress. So try to switch it up from the default grab. Everybody's grab site looked exactly the same. And grab doesn't have nearly as many nice themes as WordPress, but WordPress has thousands of nice themes that are free. Um, so just, you know, shop around. And by that, I mean, don't pay for one, just click the button. Um, so each site has the same requirements and the video is the thing that's variable this time. So the writing side, uh, five page, five pages of the site need of content similar to last time. Um, just what editor you picked, some links to it, a short description of what it is, pros and cons of that editor, um, alternatives, why you, why you decided to select this one. And honestly, a lot of people are making these types of calls um, as far as like, hey, are we gonna move to Gutenberg or are we gonna keep our content the same? Because Gutenberg breaks backwards compatibility with all the page content. So if you have a site that has several hundred pages, you're having to make the decision to say, and going forward, we'll do this. Um, it's the same, and it's the same call with, with hacks. Not that hacks is a backwards compatibility breaking thing, but if you were to install hacks and roll it out for your organization as a, only a few people have, but if you were, you're making the decision, we have to retrain around the way that we edit and get our material out to the internet for everybody. So um, how this system stores its data Right, so explain how it manages HTML or complex content or doesn't, right? Some of them don't, like TinyMC doesn't have the ability to manage complex content necessarily. Um, screenshots and examples of the relationship between the page saving and it going into post content is required for this, right? So it's a very similar site uh, requirement to the last one. Um, and then embed your video submission in, in page five with you know whatever option you decided to pick. So for the video, there's three options. First one is using query monitor, uh, identify all four CRUD operations, right? So we covered, so CRUD operations, I think in lab three or four. Um, and so find them, They're, they show up all over the place, right? So if you go to a page and that already exists and you edit the title, query monitor is sure to generate a query that is an update statement. There's one of the four right there. Select statements happen on literally every page to make the page load. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to see a page without a select statement. Um, so demonstrate the relationship between the CMS executing the user action, right? So like editing a page, creating a page, or just viewing content. And what's happening with the back end to make that occur, right? So um, I'll, go through, I'll go through what Query Monitor does on Thursday. It's really pretty, pretty simple. It does all the work for you. Shows you exactly the queries that are running. Um, so find a query, like a select statement that would say like show, you know, select star from WP underscore posts, which probably happens on like the homepage. Um, and then run the results in PHP by admin to demonstrate that you understand how this connection relationship's happening. Um, Cause this is basically a finished big application you have to know how it works end to end. And this lets you monitor it in the browser is pretty sick. So um, this could be tied to the editor of choice or just literally any action. This doesn't matter what editor you pick in this case. 
So option two would be create a multi-site instance of WordPress. And that's not actually a complicated thing. It's a setting in Reclaim Hosting <laughs> on the form that says make a multi-site, which Reclaim Hosting says, are you sure you want to do this? Because it's not recommended. Um, you use this as the basis for explaining table prefixing and the pros and cons of this approach. Um, show the relationship between requesting a new site in a multi-site in, in the user interface and the back end creating tables that make that new site a real thing. Um, edit one of the site's uh, pages of content and show the associated database table content. So that's just that you get the concept of a multi-site instance of a thing and table prefixing. Option three is install Classic Press, which I bet in any other course that would sound hard, but it's literally go and click the button, it says Classic Press. So installing this in WordPress each take about two minutes. Um, and contrast its default editing experience with the Gutenberg default editing experience. This is a huge inflection point for tens of millions of websites. This is a real um, topic that's been happening in the industry for about the last six months as to which way people will go, whether they'll move their entire workflow off of this because of this one change. So using Query Monitor on both sites, um, because the plugins work everywhere, See which performs better on a page that has similar content. So just like make a page that has, you know, two paragraphs, an image, a YouTube video or whatever. They just need to be the same content. Um, if there's little or no difference, state that. It's entirely possible based on the way, you know, if you made a page that had four paragraphs, it hopefully renders at the exact same speed, no matter which one. Um, so finish with your opinion on which you'd rather teach someone to use. So this was extremely split um, last in the 402 classes because we do this like opinion based and just make the justification for using one of these editors and all, it's almost 50 50 split the two times I've run through this with about 88 people now that they either love this editor or they don't they don't get it or they realize how hard it would be to teach someone that's not really a technical user how to use it so uh, Again, this is your opinion. Just because I'm trolling McBoatface and I think Gutenberg is a dumpster fire doesn't mean everyone does. Um, it has a lot of redeeming qualities. Um, so that's totally opinion based. Um, so for Lab 7 submission, create your five page site, throw your video in there, um, and then submit it to the Lab 7 WordPress channel on Slack. It's again, do at the same time they always are. Uh, rubric for this is, did you make a site using the platform? Um, is your written content accurate and explaining the database relationship for saving page content? And did you demonstrate technique in your video based on which option you picked? Obviously it's contextualized. So again, we're using Reclaim Hosting this week. Um, installing WordPress, it's both well, it hit you right in the face. This is like one of the main reasons people use Reclaim Hosting, <laughs> to be perfectly honest in, in academia is to click the WordPress button. Um, to install Classic Press, if you just click all applications, then it's in the list of content management systems. It has this little feather and it says Classic Press if you choose to do that option. Um, these are things I'll show, show on Thursday. So um, for a lab start on Thursday, I'll demonstrate how to install, get plugins. I mean, honestly, that takes like two minutes. Um, and then I'll install the Query Monitor plugin, show how that works. And I'll show the basics of like how you would get these plugins like Elementor, uh, Gutenberg, some little nuances there in case you want to do that uh, option. So final note, um, if you need help, ask Thursday or like later this week or whatever, um, preferably not Sunday at like 10.55 p.m. when I'm nursing a kitten back to health generally would be useful. Like I can only help you so much at that point. <laughs> um, and these labs really aren't meant to, to bury you. They're to gain insight into how these systems operate and explore, um, explore new things. So um, you may, might notice my grading methodology is pretty much like, did, did it seem like you got the concept? Then you get the points. This is it's, it's a pretty easy way to engage with and learn these things, but you have to actually meet the requirements. So help me help you. <laughs> um, and these, this, uh, you know, I mentioned last week, uh, this week and next week, our entire industries 
So th these are full on career paths. If you wanna get into front end development and do static site building, um, there's a whole industry um, as far as being a part of a web shop. Same with WordPress, there's lots of lone wolf developers. There's lots of people that work for large firms doing WordPress, uh, same with Drupal next week. So these are real things you can branch out to and, and make money doing and all the information's free. So looking ahead, um, we'll model content in Drupal so major difference between WordPress and Drupal in one line is that WordPress is, hey, I made a blog and hey, we made a marketing site. Drupal is here's our data model and our workflow and everything is captured in the website itself. So it's an abstraction of a database. Um, uh, we'll also look at how Drupal and WordPress are nothing alike as far as scope and user audience, what the default package is, it's way bigger, but powers way less stuff. Um, and keep in mind what it's like to play with a WordPress site, ease of building, who its target audience is, particularly when we get to Drupal land. You'll have two weeks to complete the Drupal one, just so that we don't run into any issues. Um, so 